ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to a very busy day two at the 13th LabSea conference. We have a very full schedule today. Three plenary sessions, five breakout sessions, and a full social program this evening. With a pub quiz organized by Richmond and a live performance from Jeremy Harmer sponsored by Pearson. More details on that throughout the day. We are also delighted to announce that One Stop English, the world's number one resource and community site for English language teachers, celebrates its 10th birthday this year. Visit Macmillan's stand today and get an e-book of premium resources absolutely free. So, happy birthday, One Stop English. On with our academic schedule. It is my great pleasure this morning to announce Michael Carrier, Director of English Language at the British Council in London. He will be speaking on innovation and technology in ELT, new ways of supporting teachers and learners. Please give Michael your appreciation. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me in the back there? Very good. Uh, we're using fancy technology <laughs> this morning because we've been talking a lot at the conference about technology, so we wanted to make sure that we use as many pieces of technology as possible. Some of them are even connected to things. Let's see if it works. Uh, thank you very much for coming so early in the morning. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I just arrived here yesterday from the UK, 22 hours door to door. The, the wonders of modern technology, and I did wonder whether we should do this by video conferencing, <laughs> which we should also try in the future. Um, I'm very, very focused on the use of technology because my job is to try to bring English language learning uh, support, resources, assistance, training, uh, inspiration to millions, billions of learners of English around the world. British Council interacts with about uh, know, 700 million students of English around the world, tries to help them improve their resources. And similarly with teachers, they're around. Did you know how many teachers of English there are in the world? <laughs> Apart from you. These are the most important ones. <laughs> Apart from you, there are an about another 11.4 million teachers of English in the world. Uh, and we try, oh, I'm just explaining the background to why I'm here. My, my job is to try and help them with teacher training, teacher development, resources, all of the things that the British Council does. And in working in a, uh, those areas, and for many years, I've been focused on how we can uh, apply technology, and I notice on the schedule there's lots of uh, talks about technology, but the crucial thing is, the benefits of technology, is that it's not about the technology. Forget the technology and think only about the learning, the opportunities for educational improvement that the students have. So it's the technology, but not the technology. That's really the message of the talk. But before looking at uh, what we can do to improve it, let's make sure that we are completely certain in our own minds about why are we doing this? Why are we teaching English? What does it mean to people? What does it mean to our students? It doesn't mean only the English language and the, their, their possibility of speaking and improving their pronunciation and uh, being more accurate in the grammar. It means something bigger. English in the world has a role in opening doors for learners of the language, of um, creating new opportunities for education, for work, for moving around the world, for changing their lives, for giving them different types of community con connection with people all around the world. In a globalized world, in a social media world, having English proficiency changes your life dramatically. Um, in, the, in the book by, uh, by David Reynolds called English Next, uh, he refers to three major drivers for English, the reason that people need English, and therefore why we are teaching it, and it's important to have that context. So for access to education, you need, uh, especially in, uh, in some countries where higher education is often now given postgraduate, especially uh, English instruction. Uh, and even at secondary school level in many parts of the world, many other subjects are taught partly in English. English as a medium of instruction is growing very, very rapidly around the world. So without good proficiency, both for the learner and also for the teacher, uh, you're restricting what you can have access to. Employability is really important, being able to work anywhere in the world or even to get a better job in your own country. Now, in some countries, that's not necessarily uh, the current situation. Perhaps in, in some of the countries that you're in now, uh, you don't get such a huge benefit, but this will change. We've just published a report 
uh, a hard data economic study of the value of English. Uh, and we did this for different developing economies in the world because I read a book that explained the difference in your salary level if you have good English skills. And in Europe, this was based on Switzerland originally, if you had basic English skills, your salary was 16% higher than the average. If you had very, very good English skills, your salary was 50% higher than the average salary. And we did an economic study across five countries and found that the average salary increase for somebody with good English skills was between 25 and 40 percent, um, the range of, uh, of those averages. So English is important for people in their future lives. It's also important because the world is changing, not just the world of English and, and business and, and so on, but the world of education. And I would like to see English uh, the, what we do, English language teaching, more firmly embedded in education. We tend to separate it out and talk about English language teaching. We, ha we have here an English language teaching conference, but in a way, we shouldn't be doing that only. We should be focusing on having an education conference because we're helping to educate people. And one of the most interesting books I read recently was uh, 21st Century Skills by Bernie Trilling and Charles Fidel. I can highly recommend it. It's an American book, so it's written in that American style with lots of uh, anecdotal stories and human, human stories, which uh, some people like and some people don't like. But it, it basically says that we need to upgrade our education systems in the world to education 3.0, to, to understand the concept of 21st century skills. Now, I'm not going to read all of these out, but I'll just flash some of them up for you to look at. But basically what they're saying, and this is relevant to England, what they're saying is that we need to move into a situation where all kinds of education and learning are available not just in formal education in classrooms when the teacher is present, but also outside the classroom, beyond the classroom, uh, using the best technologies, using the best types of uh, teacher technique, using new ideas about how people learn and why people learn and so on. And I love this, this one quote, I have to point here because I can't see this on the screen. Um, a new vision of learning as an activity, not a place. So you don't go to a school to learn, you learn wherever you are. You learn outside the classroom as well as inside. That's a simple sentence to say, but it can have a lot of consequences, and it can have a lot of, uh, I hope, meaningful changes for our students too. Uh, so in the, in the 21st century skills, these are some of the key skills that they focused on. New ways of thinking, new, new ways of working, especially collaboratively, and that m matches very well with what we do in English in communicative and task-based learning and using social media and so on. Tools for working, information literacy, ICT, computer literacy, data literacy, and so on. So all of this, to my mind anyway, converges to show that ways of learning, ways of teaching, the requirements of the inputs for education, the outcomes that help people in their lives, uh, all pull together, and English sits at the heart of this for your learners. English gives them access to these 21st century skills and gives them access to utilize and apply them uh, in the rest of the, the world. Um, they summarize the 21st century skills very easily, by the way. Um, do you, you remember the three R's? Reading, writing, arithmetic. Very beautifully spelled. Uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic are the three R's, the basics of education. Multiply that by these seven 21st century skills, we get 21. Very silly, but a, a good way to remember that we are trying to have uh, an educational impact on the world that brings collaboration, cross-cultural understanding, uh, better forms of communication, more creative ways of learning, encouraging students in the classroom to be creative, innovative, communicative, and so on. So that's a kind of a background, and I think it helps us to understand and what some of our challenges are. The other aspect of embedding English in the wider world is to think about who it is we're teaching. Uh, and although one can take these uh, analyses a little bit too far, so you might be skeptical, there's a generational shift in some ways in how people learn and how they look at learning. Um, we, have, we currently have in many schools around the world, especially if you're in a language school, you're teaching four generations at the same time. The old, 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 very ancient baby boomers, people like me and Jeremy in the back there. <laughs> we're, we're the old guy. All of you guys, the young people, 
Generation X, Generation Y, Millennials, whatever you call them. Uh, some psychologists have, uh, uh, have come up with the idea that there are different ways of learning and uh, that people are more peer-oriented, they're, you know, they're less concentrated, the young people, Millennials especially, are very screen-focused because they watch computers all day and they play with the phones all evening, and this changes their powers of concentration. I don't know to what degree this is 100% applicable, but it's useful for us at least to think about it. And uh, here's, a, here's a study that showed uh, in the US how young people, teenagers especially, how much time they were using um, social media, collaborative media, screen-based media. And this must surely have an impact on the way people learn and the, the way that, that people react to our teaching. One of the comments in the book on 21st century skills was this. It said, imagine somebody who lived in 1855. And imagine that you could get a time machine and go back to 1855 and take this, maybe your great-great-grandfather, and take this person and bring them to today and show them the world around them. And they would be just amazed. Planes, computers, microwaves, also whatever, iPods. They would be just amazed at the modern world and really excited or terrified. The one thing that they would be very comfortable with because it hasn't changed at all, is the classroom. Teacher at the front, students in rows, people writing things down, putting their hand up, answering questions, hasn't changed very much at all. So we need to think about whether for new generations and for uh, new ways of looking at the world, we need to change a little bit. Uh, the business school, Ashridge Business School in uh, London, did a study, an academic study of uh, learning styles at Generation Y, and these are some of the comments they came up for, came up with. So that doing is more important than knowing. Uh, younger students want to have uh, more immediate feedback. They don't have the sort of long-term deferred gratification. Number five, multitasking. I'm much more interested in multitasking and so on. These are things you can take with a pinch of salt, but I think it's useful to have some idea of uh, looking at things in a different way, especially because. We want to make sure that the way that we teach English, the way that we help people learn English, is slightly more varied than this. These are the two main approaches to learning English. You know what I mean by these images. The first one is what happens in most state school, uh, secondary school, even university levels. It's the drip, drip, drip feed version of learning English. One hour a week, two hours a week, maximum. Two, three hours if you're very lucky. Not usually more than that. Is it possible to become a really proficient English speaker in all skills on two hours a week for five years of, or so of secondary school? No. I think we've learned that over the years. Uh, the, other, the other method is what we try to do when we send students overseas to intensive, intensive courses in the US or in the UK. The intensive, drop people in the, the deep end eight hours a day, seven hours a day, six hours a day. That could be very successful. That's where I used to teach very often myself. What we take from that is that we need other, as well as these, because we're constrained by the, the real world, we need other ways. And this, to me, is the point of technology. Technology goes in between these and takes learning beyond the two hours a week and gives us the chance to do more uh, interesting things in other parts of the people's lives. It puts a new learning mode between drip feed and intensity, and it, it encourages us to integrate the outside world, the external English-speaking world, bringing the internet into the classroom, bringing English language exposure through technology into the classroom, integrating the personal world. People are using their phones, people are using their TVs and their DVD players at home. Let's make sure that they get exposed to English, that we incorporate that kind of technological access into how we plan our lessons and how we plan what we're going to uh, do with the, with the learners. And especially because, as it says on the left here, there are lots of different modes of learning now. Blended learning you're familiar with, asynchronous and uh, non-synchronous. Um, synchronous and asynchronous learning meaning it's at the same time or not at the same time uh, that all the learners and teachers are coming together. The one that I find very interesting is time-shifted learning. Uh, learning any time, any place. If you're teaching adults especially, you'll find that they're very time uh, challenge, time poor, and they want to be able to learn uh, whenever it's convenient for them. So different modes of learning that technology can help us to, to work on. So let's just take a couple of minutes, talk to the person next to you. Do you agree with this generational change, what technology might uh, make possible for us? Are your students different from five years ago or ten years ago? 
if you were to teach her five years ago, uh, are your students different from how you were uh, when you were teaching? Take 60 seconds just to discuss that. <coughs> Anybody has a strong comment? Shout it out and I'll repeat it so that other people can hear it. Anybody got a particular comment? Do you think it's true or not true? Yes. True? Yes. Anybody got a strong comment? No? Well, let's think about what the implications of all of that uh, might be. For me, for, for this talk, I want to talk about the, the sort of technology implications. We need to be using the, the different technologies. And obviously, we already use uh, uh, video and audio, and some of you use interactive whiteboards. How many people have got an interactive whiteboard in their school? Yeah, you see? You're very lucky. You're very lucky. That's really excellent. And those people who have not got one, if you haven't got an interactive whiteboard, have you got the data projector? Have you got the data projector? Even without the whiteboard, just the projector. Yeah, okay. So those are the pioneers of a new way of using, using projectors. So using phones, using tablets, using